This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by the incredible Grim Hollow Player's Guide, which is now available for pre-order. This book is jam-packed with player options for dark fantasy settings, including two new subclasses for every class in Dungeons & Dragons, six of which we got to write. We got the opportunity to write some really cool subclasses for this book, including the Highway Rider Rogue and the Oath of Pestilence Paladin, as well as many other awesome YouTubers like XP to Level 3 and Runesmith who also contributed subclasses to this book. This book is also jam-packed with options for transformations to turn your characters into vampires or werewolves, as well as a blood magic system. The book is totally compatible with 5th edition and jam-packed with character inspiration ideas for your next game. So check out the links below to pre-order your copy of the Grim Hollow Player's Guide. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for DMs. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are taking a look at the new optional class features introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything for bards, clerics, and druids. This is part two of a four-part series where we are going to be going over all of the new options presented to all of the classes in D&D 5e. Uh, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything introduced a bunch of new options for every single class. In some cases, we get new spell lists, new options that you get alongside the existing ones, or ones that you can swap out existing abilities for the ones presented. So we're going to take a look at the new class features and new spells that have been added to these three classes and decide which ones are most worthwhile, which ones are more perhaps not adding too much, and deciding which of these three classes kind of made out like a bandit. <laughs> There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. So to kick things off, all three of these classes actually got very similar features added. They got an expanded spell list with both new spells from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, but also existing spells from the player's handbook that have been just added to their spell list as well. They also got the ability to retrain their cantrips when they gain ability score increases. And in all three cases, they also got something that lets them use one of their limited use class features in a different way. So in the case of the Bard, the Bardic Versatility feature allows the Bard to change their cantrips, but also which skill they have expertise in whenever they gain an ability score increase. So basically once every four levels. Bards also gain Magical Inspiration, which gives more options for how they can use their Bardic Inspiration die. When they hand out a Bardic Inspiration die, it can now be used to add to either the damage or healing of spells that they cast. The important thing, though, is that it's only one target affected by that spell. So if you give your wizard a Bardic Inspiration die and they fireball a bunch of orcs, only one orc takes extra damage from that rather than all of them. The same case that if you give that Bardic Inspiration to a Cleric and they cast Mass Healing Word, only one person gets that extra die. In terms of this ability, I do think that it's nice to have more options and I could see this being useful in certain situations. But I am still more so going to rely on the core uses of Bardic Inspiration. I think adding an additional die to a d20 roll has much bigger impacts than a little bit of extra damage or healing. If you really, really need that extra scoop of healing to make sure that somebody's going to survive, then maybe. But I definitely would rather add this to a saving throw or attack roll. It, it really just comes down to which, which is having the bigger impact. As you said... Adding a d6 or a d8 to a d20 roll can, on average, like a d6 is a 3.5, which is like a 15% swing in a d20 roll. Whereas adding 3.5 or 4.5 damage to a fireball, uh, mathematically, that's just a much smaller percent increase, especially when it doesn't apply for AoEs. Do I think this is a bad ability? No, we're just adding more options for the bard. Um, but I just don't think that it compares yeah. to the options already presented. Yeah, if your choice is to give a bardic inspiration to the blaster wizard or the gloomstalker ranger or the polar master fighter and damage is your goal, I think you're going to get more, more mileage out of giving it to the fighter or the ranger than the wizard. That being said, the bards do have another thing that they gain here that I think is incredible, and that is the new spells given to the bard. They get an arrangement of the new spells added in Tasha's as well as just additional spells 
added to their list from the core rules of D&D. And what a great spell list this is. Incidentally, the only two spells Bard's actually got that are totally new in Tasha's Cauldron and everything are Intellect Fortress and Dream of the Blue Veil. Dream of the Blue Veil is just plot in spell form yeah. so it's hard to even consider it a new spell intellect fortress is a decent spell but it's very specific in its usage all the other spells here that bards get are existing spells that weren't on the bard spell list already from the player's handbook and man is this a nice helping of new spells we've got command we've got aid we've got enlarge reduce we've got slow we've got mirror image telepathic bond prismatic spray and prismatic wall as well as hero's feast yes okay so not only do all of these feel appropriate and i was kind of surprised to be like oh bards didn't already have these yeah uh but okay adding aid and command um those two right off the bat are are big deals for me yeah uh, command is such a useful spell also feels appropriate for a bard using their kind of like guile and charisma to command people to do things uh, aid, we like to see a little bit more healing and helpful buffs on our bard. Bards are utility and support characters. Aid is one of the best utility and support spells in the game. Well, now we have a charisma-based character that is a good vehicle for inspiring leader that gets aid and hero's feast. We've talked about this combo before of using aid, hero's feast, and inspiring leader to boost the hit point maximum and then layer on temporary hit points for your entire party. Yeah. And now every bard has this option before them, and I, I think it's really hard to not justify doing it because it's such a massive buff. And again, aid and hero's feast don't create temporary hit points, so their effects on boosting the hit points of the of the party they stack with the temporary hit points granted by inspiring leader. This now makes the bard the best vehicle in the game for this combo, yeah. and I think that's that's awesome. I also think Enlarge Reduce is just another useful buff or debuff spell that I love seeing on the bard. Mirror Image, so much fun. You can now play that kind of tricksy bard who like separates into multiple bards. And Slow, again, these are all iconic spells that are so useful. These are all on my list of spells that I personally love taking whenever I can. And to see them on the bard is just terrific. Often these were spells that were on our top tier picks for a bard's magical secrets. And so lore bards just love this because now you can have a lore bard that has counterspell, haste, and slow. And that feels really tasty. And you also still get to have aid and hero's feast. Again, those were all often spells that with a lore bard, I was really tempted to pick up. And now you just get them for every bard as yeah. well so i think well the, the the lore bard kind of has a less agonizing choice as a lore bard you've got an easier justification for picking up fireball and counterspell and all those other things whereas the non-lore bards who don't get magical secrets till 10th level that's going to ease up that choice yeah right let's also talk about i mean prismatic wall is one of your top picks that's something that I think both of us wanted to take as a magical secret anyway. Yeah. But now now it's there. It's an option. Yeah. The other features like the new ways to use your Bardic Inspiration and the typical uh, swapping out your, uh, your options, uh, those are kind of, you know, those are sprinkles on the mm -hmm. ice cream. But the real delicious treat here is this new spell list. I think the hardest thing about this new spell list is that the Bard's number of spells known hasn't increased. So now the choice of what spells are you going to learn is going to be even more difficult. The thing is, is that Aid and Hero's Feast, um, I think if your bard was picking up healing spells, maybe you want to just take Healing Word and go with Aid and, and this stuff and not worry about maybe packing more healing or defensive spells because these are such good buffs that will work with everything else that you have. I think that you still run into that situation of bards love having spells like hypnotic pattern and it's that there's that classic debate of hypnotic pattern or slow which which one are you going to take right um so it, it does make some of the choices of which spells you want to pack with your bard more difficult hmm. but i think that uh, you know some of them are just no-brainers like i think command is a no-brainer as we move on to the clerics, they also get a few new abilities and a new expanded spell list. 
Their first ability is Harness Divine Power. This is a new option to use your Channel Divinity feature. You can now use it to regain an expended spell slot. This spell slot can't be any higher than half of your proficiency bonus. So that does mean that the highest you're really going to get is a third level spell slot, and that's not until later levels. Um, Again, with this ability, I, I think that this is a Sprinkles ability, which we're, we're going to see a lot in Tashes. Mm -hmm. This doesn't change or make the Cleric more amazing. If you are out of spell slots and still have a Channel Divinity option, then maybe this is the right choice. But a lot of Clerics have some pretty game-defining Channel Divinity features I that agree. are more useful. I, I think that for many Cleric subclasses, your Channel Divinity power is such a big part of your play style. Um, and it kind of, this is on the lowest end of the totem pole because every Cleric also has the option to turn Undead and Undead are a very common enemy type. So for, for many clerics, for most of your character's career, this power is going to get you back a first level spell slot or a second level spell slot, which if you're even a 12th level cleric, your channel divinity for turning undead is probably going to have a bigger impact on a combat encounter against undead than anything that you might be able to do with a second level spell slot. And at lower levels, I, I also think most channel divinity powers are stronger than what most clerics can do with their first level spell slots. Yeah, I, so, see, I see this being the pinch ability, like I'm out of spell slots and a camp, combat encounter just went down and mm -hmm. I have a spell that could end this combat encounter. I think that for some of the cleric subclasses with more um, niche channel divinity powers, maybe you'll use this. It still feels... Yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to use this very much, right? Like, a Twilight Cleric is never going to use this. Yeah. A Life Domain Cleric or a Light Domain Cleric is probably never going to use this. Yeah, again, it's 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 there, which is nice. But yeah. uh, none of the Tasha's features take away from the subclasses, which I think is important to say, that even when we're like, eh, it's still good to have. Yeah. But it's is it going to be always useful? Eh. You also get Cantrip Versatility. So just like the Bard... Whenever you gain an ability score increase, you can swap out some of your cantrips around. I think clerics have a pretty small selection of cantrips anyways, and once you've got, like, Thaumaturgy, Guidance, and Sacred Flame, you're kind of set. So this is cool if you want to, like, switch things around a little bit, especially for some of those cleric subclasses that do get extra cantrips. Yeah. Maybe, but again, I think that for a lot of clerics, your cantrips are set it and forget it anyways. There's also an 8th level feature called Blessed Strikes. Now, this is interesting because it swaps out for your subclass features. Now, mind you, every cleric has the same subclass feature at 8th level. And that is either Divine Strike or Potent Spellcasting. Now you can swap that option out for this one, which allows you to add an additional D8 of damage to either cantrips that you cast once per turn or a weapon attack. So what's interesting here is if you are a cleric who has divine strike, I think it's worth it to swap this out because you're still getting your D8 damage on weapon attacks, but now you also get to add to your cantrips. If you're a more spellcastery cleric who has potent spellcasting and isn't really in melee combat that often and is actually trying to avoid it, you might stick with potent spellcasting. The potent spellcasting feature adds your wisdom modifier to the damage of your cleric cantrips. So the average of a d8 roll is 4.5, which makes potent spellcasting slightly better on average if you have a wisdom score of 20. So you could switch out potent spellcasting for this feature on the gamble that you're going to get the bigger roll on the d8. But overall, I think that for many cleric subclasses that get um divine strike like the trickery domain cleric the temp the tempest domain cleric and the twilight domain cleric all get the divine strikes feature but all of them really are more spellcaster oriented in their play style like that's how i would prefer to play them so i would swap that to get the d8 absolutely damage. yeah and that's the big thing is the the subclasses that don't have this any sort of added benefit to their spell casting you're still getting a d8 on your weapon attacks mm -hmm. But now if you are relying on your cantrips, which a lot of clerics are going to, then you're adding to that as well. So I do think this is a really useful feature. Now finally, we come to the additional cleric spells. Clerics also only get two new spells added that are totally new in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. 
Spirit Shroud and Summon Celestial. Spirit Shroud is okay, but I think that you really have to be a subclass or a class that has extra attack or the ability to attack multiple times in a turn to get the most out of it. Otherwise, I think you're better off sp sticking with Spirit Guardians. Summon Celestial, on the other hand, is a really great summon spell. Uh, it lets you summon a flying archer angel to shoot your enemies or smite them with a mace, and it has a little bit of healing powers as well. I think it's a really worthwhile contender to consider over Spirit Guardians if your cleric wants to deal damage against a single enemy. One of the really cool things on the spell list, though, is that clerics gain some of the aura spells that were specific to paladins beforehand. That is Aura of Vitality, Aura of Life, and Aura of Purity. Now, probably the biggest, most impactful choice here is the Aura of Vitality that you get. With Aura of Vitality, as a bonus action, you can heal somebody within the Aura for 2d6 uh, hit points while the spell lasts. What's really insane about this, though, is actually the implications that it has outside of combat. You could sit with your party all gathered in a circle and heal them up. Imagine putting this on a life domain cleric who gets to add additional dice to that healing pool. Over the course of the one minute duration of Aura Vitality, you can put out 20 d6 points of healing that you can spread across your entire party. On average, that's 70 points of healing. We're talking about pre-nerf healing spirit amounts of healing here. Like, remember healing spirit? It's back in pod form. Um, this is a big deal. And for a life domain cleric, this is gonna be 120 points of healing yeah. to your whole party. It's a full heal up, basically, in, in for a third level spell slot. Um, and I think it's a real game changer. Um, Aura of Vitality was one of those spells that only paladins got it. So it didn't come online until about 10th level of play. Bards could take it as a magical secret and it was a really tempting one and it still is a really tempting one. But I do think that at the end of the day, having it on a cleric is just... I mean, it makes sense because we think of the clerics as the healers. Yeah. And there's a lot of clerics that actually are equal in their healing capabilities to things like bards and other classes. So to put something like this on here that not only speaks to the cleric as a healer as a whole, but the life domain cleric, who is our greatest healer in the game, can really make use yeah. of this spell in, in game-shifting ways. Now, of course, also added to the cleric spell list are Sunbeam, Sunburst, and Power Word Heal, which I didn't realize that clerics didn't already get Power Word Heal. Again, <laughs> feels appropriate. Why yeah. wasn't it here? But now it is. And Sunbeam in particular is a great spell for the six level spell slot for clerics. We talked about our high, our favorite high level cleric spells before and talking and those included spells like Word of Recall and and spells like Hero's Feast, of course, which are, are spells that you can kind of strategically use. Whereas this gives clerics a high level, oh, I want to deal some damage. Not only that, but I got to say for the light domain cleric, uh, this feels uh, super appropriate. Totally on brand. Yeah. Totally on brand. Yeah, so overall, um, I think the big winner here for the clerics is Aura Vitality. I think so. Um, I do think that there's some cool options here. The spell list is great to just add these additional spells, but Aura Vitality is the huge winner. And I think that every mm -hmm. cleric should yeah. definitely consider taking that. But mid-level clerics are going to get a nice boost in their damage dealing capability from Summon Celestial and Sunbeam. As we move on to the druids, same idea, they gain a few cool features and some great spells. Let's talk about the features first. At second level, they gain Wild Companion. This is an option that allows you to use one of your wild shape options to use Find Familiar. And you get to summon your familiar. It's Fey now instead of the regular type. And it lasts a number of hours equal to half your druid level. Not bad, especially because wild shape uses do come back on a short rest. So once you get into the mid-levels of play, you can summon this guy at the beginning of the day, take a short rest, get your wild shape uses back, and you still got your familiar floating around. I find that this is, out of the abilities we've looked at so far, this is probably one of my favorite ones that's been added to a class. I think that druids having fine familiar 
is super thematic. Why aren't druids getting more animal companions? This is a way of giving them a constant yes. animal companion. I think this is really thematic and it opens up a lot of great role play for the druid as well. So I think that druids are really going to like having this around uh, and it feels appropriate. I actually think that the duration restriction is a little bit draconian. I could live without it um, personally, but it's neither here nor there. Uh, I think that for a lot of druid subclasses that aren't moon druids, this gives you something to actually do with your wild shape. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's something that we see is like moon druids are all about using the wild shape as intended and doubling down on that. But a lot of other druids uh, aren't going to be using wild shape nearly as often. And I'm loving all of these new mm. options we get in the new subclasses and things like that that are saying, hey, how about some other ways to use wild shape? Yeah, I, I think that the, the new subclasses introduced in Xanathar's and Tasha's do have cool ways to use their wild shape. And I'm glad that the developers have been doubling down on this, give druids more things to do with their wild shape feature. It's a really, really great ground. And just having this as a cool role-playing baseline, it's awesome. Druids are also getting cantrip versatility. Again, I think druids are pretty set at it and forget it when it comes to cantrips. Like, you're probably taking shillelagh and druidcraft. <laughs> but if for some reason you hate the cantrip you picked, hey, you yeah. can swap it out now. Yeah. Now with the Druid spell list, again, we see some great picks here. The only new spells that they're gaining are summoning spells. They gain Summon Beast, Summon Fae, and Summon Elemental. All of these are pretty great summoning spells, but the thing is that Druids already get Conjure Woodland Beings and Conjure Animals, which I think are just generally better. But if your DM has something against them, then these might be a good option. I mean... Summon Beast is pretty cool because it's the second level spell. So you're going to have that before you would get the ability to conjure animals, which I think you'll. It, it, there's a really good reason to use it. Yeah. Um, conjure Fey is really good. That that little Conjured Fey does a lot of damage and it teleports around and gives itself advantage. Uh, the Summon Elementals aren't bad either. So these are good spells mm -hmm. and they're certainly a little bit more manageable at the table compared to conjure woodland beings and um con and conjure animals so if you're if you found that those summoning spells were a little bit of a problem for you before they they have some wonky interactions with the shepherd's druid so you might have to just figure out you know because some of the shepherd druids features key off of how many hit dice the summon creature has and these summon creatures don't have hit dice in their stat blocks. So you have to do a little bit of massaging to figure out how that works if you're playing the iconic Druid Summoner. But there's also lots of new additions to the Druid spell list as well. We get some great pickups like Enlarge Reduce, Revivify, Cone of Cold, uh, all great additions to the spell list. I was actually kind of surprised again to realize that Druids didn't have Revivify. Yeah. But this seems wildly appropriate. And now your Druid can be that revival party member. Speaking of healing your party uh, and speaking of healing spirit being back in pog form, uh, Druids get Aura of Vitality as well. Uh, so it's kind of like, sorry, we nerfed healing spirit. <laughs> have Aura of Vitality. <laughs> Which, again, the old healing spirit could be abused to do a lot more healing than what you could get out of Aura Vitality. But I think it's appropriate. I also like that the druids are getting some more blasty spells in the form of um, Cone of Cold and Incendiary Cloud. I think that just adds a little bit more muscle to the high-level druid spellcasting, which gives you more reason to not be a moon druid. Yeah, I think that with this expanded spell list and some of the extra options, we're seeing something like being able to gain Find Familiar mm -hmm. uh, now makes non-Moon Druids feel much more rich to play. Yeah. Do you know one of the other things, though, that I think is kind of cool? Though, if you are a Moon Druid, casting a large reduce on yourself and then wild shaping. Does the wild shape form remain enlarged? I did, yeah. Well, oh, that's a big bear. That's a big bear. <laughs> The Druids actually gained some really useful options here. I love the Find Familiar. I love the... Or it could be a little bear. You... That's a little bear. That's a little bear. Actually, you know another cool way to use that? Tiny horse. Tiny horse or wild shape into a giant eagle and make yourself even bigger. And now your party has an airliner. Yeah. 
I mean, in large reduce only lasts for one minute, so it's a little bit difficult to get anywhere yeah, with that. that but... That'll be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tiny horse. <laughs> so overall, the druids, I think, gained some really cool features. Maybe some of the most useful features that we've seen out of these three. Uh, the ability to gain Find Familiar is really useful. And I really like the spells, Aura Vitality and a few more Blasty spells on here. Uh, and some great utility spells. I, I think that the, the druids gain quite a bit. But overall, who do we think the, the true winner is? I mean, really, they're all winners. Yeah. But... It I, I think the bard really gets a lot, but it's measured by the fact that the new spell list means it comes at the expense of the already amazing bard spell list. So you have to choose, you know, it makes the, your choices even harder. Like, let's look at all three of these. The bard now has aid and hero's feast. What does it do? Makes their party more re resilient by increasing their hit points. The Druid and the Cleric now both have Aura of Vitality. What is that doing? Making the party more resilient. So in all three cases, all three of these classes are really strong support and healing classes as it is. And all three of them got new tools for being even better at that job. So I think yeah. that if you have a Cleric or a Druid or a Bard in your party, they're really going to make your party as a whole a lot tougher than they used to be. Yeah, I do think that really, I, I don't even know if we can pick a winner. I think that all three mm. of these classes, especially with the expanded spell lists, all three of them walk away with some things that have larger implications than yeah. what it appears on paper. I think the winner, to be honest, is anybody that has a bard, cleric, or druid in your party. You're all winners. Yeah, be because in, in, in all three cases, these spells on those that spell list makes it easier and more efficient. Like, for a cleric or druid, being able to drop Aura of Vitality and heal up everybody in the party, rather than having to spam Healing Word or, or Mass Cure Wounds or even just regular Cure Wounds, like, it, it lets you heal up the party. Yeah. Right? Um, the Bard is actually going to get to buff up the party and protect everybody and still get to do all their cool things in combat. So, the the it makes the job of that character to support their party easier and actually doesn't take away from your ability to still do your cool things like as you're as as the druid you're still going to do whatever the cool thing like be a cool moon druid be a blaster uh light domain cleric be a trixie bard but then you are also now healing and supporting your party at the same time you're doing the things that you love doing with your character and that is the secret to making support classes really good like if a support character can support the party while still getting to do cool things on their own, I like it. So this has been a look at the optional class features added in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything for bards, clerics, and druids. Uh, stay tuned, we're going to go over the rest of these in future videos. Tell us about your thoughts on what these three classes gained in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you'd enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider joining our Patreon community by following the links in the description below. Don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we have plenty more guides on the classes of D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.